Okay, you will dive. I'm calling the meeting back to order. Uh, the board has come back from executive session. We're actually recessing our executive session so that we can conduct the business meeting, but since we voted officially to go into executive session before we can restart the business meeting, we do need to vote um, to come out of executive session. Uh, so I'll go ahead and make the motion that we uh, recess our executive session and return to the business se session. Is there a second? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. So the first item we have for uh, the business meeting is election of officers, which we do annually. Uh, so I open the nominations for the office of president. Do we have any nominations? I nominate Nadia to continue for another year. I second. I feel like she's pragmatic really good at reading things <laughs> to keep our meeting moving. I think mean, you've done a great job, and it's always tough after your first year to finally get in the swing of things. Um, and I appreciate all the hard work that you do, especially behind the scenes that people don't know. So I, I strongly second that nomination. Thank you so much. Do we have any other nominations? Nominations be closed. OK. We have a motion to close nominations. All those in favor say aye. 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 We will then go ahead and vote for the position of uh, president. Uh, no, well, we, we close nominations. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, uh, we have the nomination on the table, so uh, we will take that as a motion. All those in favor of Nadia Jenkins for board board president, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. So we will then uh, go ahead and open nominations for the office of vice president. I nominate that Judy Wachowski stay vice president for another year. I second. <laughs> I'm gonna, I, I don't mean to put a wrench in it, but because the three of us are up for election and I know not all of us are running, I feel like it should be someone that we know so will be here next year um, because they'll have to take over okay. president. Okay. And I mean, I'm not opposed, Judy, to you being vice president. I just want to put that out there. If the no, well, if that doesn't matter, <laughs> if you guys don't think it matters, then I'm fine with Judy. A, you can make the nomination. So I mean, you have the right to nominate anybody you want, and then the board will vote. The board okay. will vote. Yeah. Well, no, it's fine. If you don't think that that is necessary, then I'll just um, the the precedent is that if the president and vice president are not. Um, are, are up for election and are not reelected, that the board nominates a temporary president to start the meeting, and then the election of officers happens. All right, with that said. <laughs> All right, I'm not going to go ahead and vote on that one this time. We're just going to take that as like a suggestion so that we don't have to do a motion in a, for both things. Um, so let's go ahead and sit, said and have. Uh, a motion that we um, vote for the office of vice president. I move that Judy Rakowski be vice president. Second. All right. We have the motion and the second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All right. Thank you. Uh, that's our organizational piece over for the meeting. Uh, we next have on the agenda approval of the minutes for the December 8th, 2021 business meeting. Are there any questions or comments on the minutes before we make a motion to approve the minutes? No questions. I vote to approve the minutes. I will second. So we have the motion and the second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? That motion passes, and we now move on to informational reports, starting with a summary of current events from uh, Superintendent Glass. Good evening. Uh, I uh, wanted to start by sharing with you the progress on my goals, as you requested. Um, I shared with you the document that has now the blue um, added language for the things that we've been working on and, and accomplished so far. 
Um, I did want you to know that um, with uh, one of the things that we talked about last month was to improve teacher retention and staff recruitment. Um, we've established those committees, uh, and that is also going to be part of meeting Kemper this year. Uh, Mr. Markle and Mr. Buckley will be leading that committee uh, to work on staff retention and recruitment. Um, so that is in the works, and we're getting prepared to do that. Um, on the second page, we are finishing up gathering first semester feedback from our staff. Um, I have been, I did that um, once last year, and then we did the panorama survey, and then we did the Google sur um, survey this year again for first semester, and so I'm looking forward to seeing that feedback from them. Um, we have been working on the improvement of the HR information and website, and you probably have seen that um, our new website is up. Um, we have some, and they just pulled information from our previous website over. So we have some work to make some changes and some additions to make that page a little bit more attractive um, and user friendly for our new um, potential teammates. Um, I wanted to let you know uh, that we are partnering with Donors Choose, and I sent you that information last week, but um, the information went out to our staff so that they could start putting their projects in. Um, and the benefit of this is that um, their projects are added to all of the national projects. We have our own landing page, and um, tomorrow, or excuse me, Friday in the Falcon Focus, um, that goes out to our families and our community. Um, I'll be sharing how people can access those projects to um, assist our um, teaching staff if they'd like to do that. Uh, and lastly, I would like to introduce Kevin Wilkinson. Kevin is the interim principal at um, McDowell Mountain. Kevin. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you very much. Uh, I just want to say that I appreciate the opportunity, Dr. Glass, and uh, the team has given me. So far, it's been wonderful. I've been felt very welcome at McDowell Mountain. The teachers have been fantastic. Um, and these two guys to my right, my, this guy to my left, have been incredibly helpful, helping me transition to this role. So I just want to uh, say thank you to them as well. They've been very helpful and I've felt very welcome. So thank you for the opportunity. Take great care of those teachers. We love them. I will. <laughs> and the little kid. Yes, and the kid. Mm -hmm. I did want to ask, because um, one of the items uh, in your uh, goal for goal number three, um, maybe it wasn't, sorry, no, goal number two, um, about uh, assessment data and that the mid-year assessments are being completed and those should be all wrapped up uh, by January 31st. Um, based on that completion date, when would there be data presented to the board so that we can see, you know, the comparison between the beginning of the year and these mid-year assessments? Um, because we already have the format, everything ready in place, um, I have to make the, the move on when reading um, report to ADE. We should be able to pull that information and get that for you for the end of February's work study session. Okay, thank you. Does anybody else have any questions or comments? Uh, and now we have our uh, governing board informational reports. I'm going to start on this side, which I never do. Dr. Barnard, do you have anything to report? <laughs> I went to Fountain Hills Coalition meeting. Um, it's really good. Great group of people. We had donuts and coffee. Um, but they really are, you know, people from all walks of life in our in our town. Um, from the sheriff's department to the sanitary district, and it's just such an amazing group of people who are doing what's best for our kids. So, shout out to Communist Coalition. Um, I also went to the ASPA conference um, in December 16th, 17th. Um, went to the uh, um, Beyond Textbooks uh, webinar. Phenomenal. Um, I actually would like to start putting things in the back and focus, the different parent um, things that they have available. I, I will sign myself that because they really 
kids who have some great resources, just to sort of send out nuggets to parents on what they can see, what they can review, um, from everything. I mean, just understand what's going on to actual our lesson plans that are available to families. Um, I went to um, a session on easy merit, and the scores across the state of Arizona are abysmal across every demographic. Um, and they're trying, they're scrambling, trying to figure out what to make of these data and how they can try to get kids on back, back on track. Um, really, really interesting. It was the first, they didn't think they were going to have the data to present, but they did. Um, and it was very sobering to, to see uh, the impact of last year on our kids. Um, but hopefully, there will be a mediation in place um, and they will use the data for good. Um, and I went to an AIA. Athletic thing. I swear I was well behaved. I promise I was really well behaved. Um, and they had some really great things to say about making sure that sports and extracurriculars, um, which they oversee, um, you know, they're starting to get really concerned about unsportsmanlike behavior. And like they told a story that was one of the teams this year for the football playoffs walked off the field because they did not get and didn't take their runner up trip. Um, and then also, um, but also about, um, and I was not aware of this, when they have their statewide events, that is fundraising. Like, they are making money off of those, and then they distribute that back to all of the schools. And I'm like, I wish people knew that, because it might be incentive for people to attend yes. those events. Um, so it costs $150,000, which is ridiculous, um, to have the football the state championships at ASU, and they make $5,000 with revenue and everything else, it just, uh, but they do take that money, divide it up, and spread it back to the community. Um, and they encourage um, schools and athletic directors to give them information um, about things that are, may not be equitable, like private schools being in the same uh, division as public schools, and they, he is very aware of that. Um, and it was actually a really good session, and I appreciated it. Um, and then they had, um, people who won awards for innovative programs. And this really, it was very well done. Um, and I would encourage others to attend if you can um, next year's conference. Um, basketball has been tons of fun. I haven't gone, I sort of saw a little bit of wrestling one night, but um, I've been trying to watch the soccer on live stream and then basketball. It's just been really fun to watch. And again, making sure people realize that it's live, things are live streamed, so more people in the community Watch if they can't attend the games. That's all I have. Well, that was a lot. <laughs> I will go next. Unfortunately, I do not have uh, really anything to uh, report. Uh, the new year is off to uh, a good start in my household, uh, personally, and, and just making sure that my uh, kid is doing her homework. <laughs> um, Mrs. Rakowski. Unfortunately, I can't uh, say what I did <laughs> because I really didn't do a whole lot. <laughs> no I worked at Chaparral High School. What about Tar Wars? You just told us you did Tar Wars. Oh, that was a while back. Uh, <laughs> that was a while back. <laughs> Mrs. Reed? Um, I went and helped uh, uh, Superintendent Glass and Krista de uh, deliver treats to the high school. I went walk the campus with them. Unfortunately, I didn't get to go to the middle school or McDowell because um, I had other commitments that day, but um, it was fun to see the teachers come out and get a snack and a drink. Um, they were very appreciative of that and it gave me an opportunity to take a view of the campus and kind of walk around and stuff now that I'm an empty nester. I don't, I'm not there that often. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, and both my kiddos are back at school, so all of my sons have been going to school. For the most part, we're back to the empty nest life. <laughs> and he brings his laundry. Yeah. <laughs> it's a buck 25 a load at school. <laughs> okay, thank you. All right, um, the next item on the agenda uh, we have in our board packet are the student auxiliary accounts on pages 23 through 31, the unaudited financial report pages 21 through 22, uh, and current enrollment and withdrawals page 32 through 33. Does anybody have any uh, questions on any of these reports? So I have a question on the enrollment. Um, 
the number that's at the bottom, and I had sent this to Superintendent Glass um, before, the, the number that shows total FHUSD enrollment, is that where we're actually at? Because if you go through from month to month to month and kind of move the, you know, add in the enrollments, take out the withdrawals, the numbers don't match. So I'm confused. I'm gonna have Krista explain that to you because she's the one that works on the report since we don't have a um, data specialist. Um, this is the one part that she has taken over for us. So Krista, could you speak to that? Yes, absolutely. So um, between our December report and our January report, you're gonna see a discrepancy of about 50-ish students. Um, we recently, because we lost our data specialists and hadn't had anybody to replace them, I'm having to learn new areas of power school that I wasn't familiar with. Um, our IT guys too. So luckily we were able to send um, Dennis Wright, our director of IT, to a very extensive power school training. He was able to um, get um, training on how to set up reports. So we now have a custom report that he has set up to run those numbers for us. So they're going to be a lot more accurate. Um, what we found in doing all of that was it was including our enrollment school. Enrollment school is simply a holding place for kiddos that are not active yet in the system. So they technically were not enrolled in our school, but now moving forward from this report, moving forward, it should uh, balance technically. But like I told um, Jill, um, you're always going to have a bit of a discrepancy. Um, it's, it shouldn't be a lot, maybe a few, um, because when we have students that um, have 10 day drops, or their parents withdraw them without notifying us, we have to backdate that to their last day of attendance. So when I go and run my report, unless I do a continuous report, which I don't think is gonna give you guys the information that you really want, um, some of those kiddos could fall in a time frame that was from the last period. Okay. So it, moving forward, I will watch it closely to make sure that um, it's a little bit uh, closer to what, that, that it is closer to what it should be. There is gonna be a little bit of a, a cushion though. So, um, I, mean, I know we can have 10 day drops anytime, but that really should be more of like a beginning of the school year effect that isn't that when we have the most 10 day drops is that's, at the beginning of the school year? That's when we have the most. We also have them at the beginning of the second semester, okay. but we can also have them um, throughout the school sure. year, yeah. but there shouldn't be there that, should be many. that many. Yeah. So really that first report that we get probably will have that and then more January area. So, but then my question is like on this enrollment report, it says 1,323 is the total FHUSD enrollment. Is that accurate? to the date of January 5th based right. on power school, okay. yes. Okay. Um, and what I will do also is I will work with the registrars to, um, to better uh, uh, their comments about, uh, so that way if it is a 10 day drop, you're gonna know it's a 10 day drop. Okay. But again, if it falls into the last period, yeah, okay. you're not gonna see it. Okay. So um, we'll try to be a little bit more precise with that information so you guys have a better idea. Okay, thank you. <laughs> yes, uh, your sir. In the past we've had a spreadsheet, uh, when I say past, I'm talking a while back, <laughs> that tracked it a little bit. By, by a year earlier, maybe even a year early basis. So we track the trend. We just have access to something like that. Yeah, no, we never run or anything like that. It's just on a periodic basis. One of the reports that could be set up? I, mean, I, I can't speak for that. I would have to ask that Dennis. to Dennis. Um, one thing I am not is techie, so <laughs> I, I don't know. Um, I get by. <laughs> So the report that I did for the board last year towards the end of the school, this, uh, this school year, I did it by hand because there is not a report in power school for us to pull that from. But um, it's uh, certainly something that we can, we can do. Yeah, I just think trends are important. So uh, that trend goes back, I mean, we, that study goes back you know, 25 years that I've been on board. So um, 
It's just a good indicator of what we went to kind of when students transfer from one grade level to another. And we get the new kindergarten and first grade students, and we know what left in the senior class. Uh, so those kind of that kind of data is really important to you know. So cohort spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. Cohort being grade level. Right. Yeah. Exactly. Like because this is great. I don't want this to go away. So this is what we always wanted in mm -hmm. detail. Yes. But to Dana's point, even if it's year over year. Mm -hmm. in like each month we would get, so you could say, oh wow, this there's this whole bunch of kids came into the kindergarten um, wherever and you know we see this increase where a bunch of kids left this grade and you know it allows us to make to ask that question yes we will now move on to public comment um, this is Rutkowski will you please read our call to the public Call to the public. This is the time for the public to comment. Time limits may be allocated on. Wait a minute. Okay. Time limits may be allocated on public comment at the discretion of the board president for the board to efficiently complete its business. The board reserves the right to prohibit any comments made in a discourteous or threatening manner. Uh, complaints about specific individuals, students, or personnel are discouraged. Personnel issues should be directed to the appropriate staff member or administrator per district policy. Members of the board may not discuss items that are not specifically identified on the agenda. Therefore, pursuant to ARS 38-431.01 H. Action taken as a result of public comment will be limited to directing staff to study the matter, responding to any criticism or scheduling the matter for further consideration and decision at a later date. Thank you. We have one public comment this evening from Mr. Buckley. Will you please come up to the podium and you probably have to turn on the mic. There's a button on the right there. Yeah. Oh, sorry, on the mic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and you have uh, three minutes for your public comment. I will be uh, timing you, so I'll give you a warning at 30 seconds. Sounds good. Um, I'm TJ Buckley, president of Fountain Hills Education Association. Um, and I'll be reading comments from our FHEA members uh, who shared these comments with me in an attempt to give you some insight into how our staff is feeling about the current COVID situation within our schools. I'm going to read as much as I can in the time limit and submit the rest in written form. Um, so, I'll start down here. It says, it's frustrating how it's the expectation that we cover classes when teachers are called out due to lack of subs and we aren't team members and saying that we have subs and teachers is incorrect. Our time isn't considered valuable and in turn we aren't being valued as employees or even people. The teachers who are here are being spread so thin and are having to take on so many extra duties, classes, and etc., that they are experiencing burnout at an alarming rate. If we are concerned about retention, this needs to be considered. Why would we want to stay in a district that clearly doesn't value us? We are bodies in a classroom and trusted, instead of trusted, valued educators. We are more concerned about needing professional babysitters for the economy that we are than we are about the quality of education that is currently being delivered in classrooms. We have many uh, students who are out sick and it's becoming impossible to keep track of who is gone and what they have missed content-wise. COVID cases are increasing daily, in-person trainings, events, and meetings are being canceled due to this, yet somehow it is fine for us to be face-to-face. -face. Our health is clearly not a priority and we are made to feel guilty for caring about our health as teachers. We have no cleaning supplies unless we submit a ticket. This obviously isn't a priority and again falls on the shoulders of the teachers, like everything else. One more thing to add uh, to our already overflowing plates. Teachers are in the trenches in the weight of the world on their shoulders right now. And thank you email simply won't cut it. Um, and then um, the one was that I think that we should have a mask mandate whenever we have been away from school for any length of time. When teachers are out with COVID, we are expected to cover classes um, that we are not compensated for. 
And then I had another comment that I um, didn't want to bring up any personnel issues, um, but just bringing up staff having to go to other schools um, that they aren't um, associated with while still having to do their duties back at their other schools. Um, and just an overall thing of um, some students showing up um, with or like with symptoms and then also um, with positive tests. So I didn't want to go too far into that one because I, I, want, I do want to respect all of our personnel and our students. Thank you. So can I follow up then with Kelly? Can you um, let us know when teachers will have the appropriate cleaning supplies in all of their classrooms rather than sending a request? Um, so they were given, or they were supposed to be given cleaning supplies at the very beginning of the year, and in fact, um, I believe, and John is here, they were delivered to the teacher's lounge at every single school, and they could pick them up. Um, in my email to them, I just let them know if they needed additional supplies to let us know. Um, that's, they should have wipes, they should have the cleaning spray, they should have gloves if they want them, masks if they want them. Um, everything should be there and available for them. And their custodian could help them as well. So do they, do they think they needed to request to you, or do they typically go to their principal? They can go to their principal, um, but they also can uh, submit and have the capacity to submit a help desk ticket online. That just says, this is what I need, and because everybody uses their supplies at a different rate. Right. Is, was there, was it anticipated that the amount of supplies that were given at the beginning of the school year was supposed to make it through the entire school year? No. Mm -mm. no. So if that wasn't the expectation, then why aren't there like, I don't know, quarterly, like, and here's more supplies? And yeah, like just supply grab them? Yes, exactly. Yeah, it would take an hour for someone to walk around the cart. Not when you shoot your store and say, grab what you need. Yeah, I, I do think that um, having them submit tickets. And I realize we're kind of going off. We, we're not supposed to make a lot of comments about public comment. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, we can, but we can talk about it when we come to the maintenance one. Yes. <laughs> Back on track with the agenda, our next item is the consent agenda, which consists of donations, which are on pages 35 through 37, accounts payable vouchers 38 through 51, payroll vouchers pages 52 through 58, the personnel action report is page 59, garnishment of wages is uh, 60 through 61, and then FHMS club approval uh, pages 62 through 63. Are there any questions or comments? Yes. So, kind of on the same line of some of the comments that were just made, my concern is, um, and, and I had submitted these questions to Superintendent Glass, is the additional teaching duties for the two special ed teachers at the elementary level. That's highly concerning to me. Um, these are two, two teachers who already have full plates, and I, I feel like sometimes we're putting too much onto our teachers, and I get it that it's a teacher shortage, but there has to be a, a, another way to help <clears throat> this room of special ed kids who need additional assistance because giving them, you know, taking duties and spreading it across teachers who are already spread thin, I just don't think that's acceptable. And so I'm really disappointed that that's our solution. And that even if teachers offer to do some work, to now, you know, give them a stipend until the end of the year, it puts a lot on their plate. So I'm just expressing my concern over expectation that. that they're then required to do it instead of when I can help, I will help. Right. It's now, you know, you have, have to, to help. help. Right. And so, you know, special ed kids obviously have different areas that come with them. Not to say that all teachers aren't spread thin, but now you know you're spending time writing up IEPs, going to IEP meetings, making sure that you know service expectations are met. There's a lot that goes along with self-contained special ed kids, and so I'm just expressing my displeasure over the fact that we have decided to give stipends to two teachers that are probably already spread very thin. And then can I ask? I know I asked it earlier. The 526 2022. If that's the effective date, it just doesn't make sense to me. They are going to be getting paid for the 5.6. Yes, that's true. That's the date that they will be getting paid. That's the date that was pulled accidentally on that report. 
So they have to do these things now and then they'll get a cut, a check cut, made to each other? Yeah, just like we do for all of our other um, staff that receive stipends. They get them at the end of the year. Um, some of them get them um, in December. Even the additional teaching duties? Mm -hmm. revisit that I think when we, we look at yes. the stipends and things like that. We have to come up with a different payroll schedule on that. Yeah, <coughs> I agree with you. To that's make them wait till the end of May for work that they've done for five months is it's not, that's not acceptable. Not I uh, want to say with the consent agenda that I'm very happy to see that we have a district nurse now. Mm -hmm. I've already talked to her. She's too great. All right, any other questions or comments at this time about the consent agenda? Hearing none, I will go ahead and move that we approve the consent agenda. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The consent agenda is approved. So we'll now move on to action items, uh, beginning with policy GCQC, Resignation of certified staff member Shelley Jensen, which is on pages 64 through 65. Do we have any questions or comments? Is this someone um, that we need to talk about? Are they being assessed a um, $1,500 if this wasn't part of this one? Or do administrators not get that? Administrators don't have that in their contract. Any other questions? All right, do we have a motion? I move that we approve the resignation of staff member Shelly Jensen. I second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Our next item, let me get back to the agenda page. Uh, again, policy GCQC, resignation of certified staff member Bailey Jensen. This is on pages 66 through 68. I would like to say I would like to approve her um, request for a waiver. Even though it's recommended not to, I would like to approve um, her request for a waiver. I think under uh, the circumstances, I personally agree with you. Do we have any other commentary before we actually vote? No, I agree with you. Do you want to go ahead and make the motion then? I move that we accept the resignation of Bailey Jensen um, and um, waive her $1,500 local data damages. I second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. The next one is uh, also, again, policy GCQC. Uh, this is for Mr. Pugliano. Questions or comments? If there's no discussion, do we have a motion? I move that uh, we recommend the approval of Mr. Pugliano's resignation and his waiver request. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion also carries. Oh, and I clicked on the wrong page. Sorry, guys. Let me get caught back up. Um, and then we also have um, policy GCQC um, related to uh, Lisa Ch Chaikin. Um, I will just comment um, that I hope the uh, details that have been provided in the resignation letter are being um, thoroughly investigated and followed up on. Yes, I, I agree and I'd like some information about what's being done on, on the, based on her letter. Yes. Um, with that said, I will go ahead and uh, move that we approve the resignation of uh, Lisa Chaikin and... She did not request a waiver, but I, I'd like to give her a waiver. I agree with that as well. And I move that we approve a waiver. Do we have a second? I second it. We have the motion and the second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. All 
All right, our next item is the minimum wage increase. Uh, Superintendent Glass, would you provide us uh, the details on this, please? Uh, so we are required by the federal minimum wage to increase to 1280, which we did. Um, we have five staff members that um, met the, um, or did not meet the minimum wage, so we are providing them with a pay increase. Um, I, I did want to share with you that because of that aggregate spending limit, um, we were looking at an equitable pay increase across the board for our um, certified staff because every time we have the minimum wage pay increase, there becomes an inequity in the salary or the wage schedule. Uh, and so, um, but because of waiting for the legislature to make a decision about that, um, the spending limit, um, we need to wait to make sure that that's approved before we can make any determination about making sure that the increase is equitable for everybody. Because we now have some staff members that just started that get paid more than some staff members that have been here so long. Can you explain that to me? If we had to move these people at the other, can we have people not making 1280? Um, we have people that might be making 1280 that have been here for a couple of years because when they started, the, um, the uh, hourly wage was lower, and so they've gotten their increases. But now they've been here for two, three years, and we just have someone new that's getting paid the same thing. As okay, it's the same. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. When will that when will that information be available to you uh, if we can adjust the other people? Uh, so they're supposed to be um, starting the conversation uh, in March, and so we're just waiting for um, for that to take place. Can, can I request that you have um, someone look at all of those people and come up with a dollar amount? We already did. I have that. It's, it'll be about two hundred thousand dollars to um, properly um, increase everyone that is getting an hourly wage. Catherine. Any other questions? All right, I recommend that the governing board authorize an increase of pay for the staff members not currently meeting the minimum wage. Second. We have the motion and the second. All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Are there any opposed? No, the motion passes. Our next item is related to the new job description for the student worker assistant. Superintendent Glass? Uh, so in an effort to um, kind of remediate some of the, um, we're, we're missing some instructional aids, and not that the students would be instructional aids, but they would provide uh, support for some of our teaching staff at McDowell Mountain, um, as well as in the office. We would like to employ some student workers in the afternoon that would be supervised and um, they'd be able to provide some additional assistance. And that's thanks to Dr. Barnard for uh, that idea um, because we do have some students that get out before noon and they have the available time. So um, we can pay for that out of impact aid. And I want to say, and I hope this isn't taken the wrong way, um, but uh, a student workers, because the minimum wage is the minimum wage, will be making the minimum wage. Um, so I think we need to um, really get a list of anybody who is at 1280 an hour that has worked in the district for a, a period of time, and we need to be taking action on them quickly because if we're going to pay students 1280 an hour, we need to be paying our staff who have been with us for a period of time for our adults who have to pay, you know, taxes and rent and all of that stuff, um, a better wage than we're paying them. One of the reasons why I asked Catherine to um, do that analysis for us because um, it, this happened in every district. You begin to see this inequity of the wage schedule when um, we don't make incremental pay increases for everyone with a minimum wage increase. Yes, go ahead. Um, in the past, we had um, students out of the classroom um, for various reasons, and it was used heavily to accommodate the students' need for public 
community service. So I'm, I'm hoping if that's not, maybe it's not happening anymore, but if it still is an opportunity for community service, I don't want to. Yeah, because if they get paid, it's no longer too Yeah, sure, you can't count yeah. That. And, and maybe maybe that's a really good way to sort of have a probation period is have everybody put in so many hours of community service, and they can just they can decide, and staff can decide if they're a good fit. Because um, right, it's not going to be a good fit for every kid. So I think that's a good idea. Um, you know, have the kids. Know. There's, yeah, some kids have tons of hours anyway, um, but just say the first however many hours is community service. But did I just read 60% of our high school kids don't have their community service hours? Well, all of them. That doesn't mean, I mean, they, they, there could be some kids that are an hour short, right? So let's be careful. <laughs> like, have, before we freak out, I, I know, know we had the discussion, like, right. we're not going to waive that. But again. my point is, there's but, a lot of kids yes, that need hours. Some so, kind of hours and, yes. and each year, there's a new freshman class that comes in that has to start fresh. So All of my Bound Hills seniors are in deficit. So I will give them the opportunity <laughs> to help me <laughs> as they volunteer. There you go. But yeah, they can only work like 12.30 to 3.30, so it's yes. like three hours. And, mm -hmm. and then I agree with Dr. Barnard that it gives the staff an opportunity to see which ones are hard workers, which ones are good fits for the kids before they get hired. So. Yeah, I mean, and that will save us from the you know payroll onboarding I mean, because if we're going to employ them there is a cost for us to go through all of those processes on our side i agree and making sure there's making sure there's a flexibility in this position because we also you know kids do have busy lives so i'd rather i, I don't want to get in a position where we have nobody apply because they can only work Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays because they have piano lessons on Wednesdays or whatever. So if the job can say something about, you know, being flexible around the students' schedules, I mean, obviously you want consistency, consistency but also understanding the life of, of some kids. I would hate to not have a great person in there just because they couldn't come on Wednesdays, for example. Okay. Any additional comments? No. All right. Do we have a motion? I recommend that the board approve the new job description for the student worker assistant. And the background here is to support the Fountain Hills Unified School District's <coughs> vision, mission, and goals, as well as assist staff with a variety of tasks, including tutoring, office tasks, office tasks, classroom assistance, outside group play with students, and student mentoring, to name a few. I will second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposed? That motion carries. We now move on to another job description. This one is for accounts specialist, accounts receivable, and procurement. Superintendent Glass, any additional detail for us on this? Um, this is an existing position, um, and the person that has been in this position has been required to do procurement, uh, but that's not um, one of the criteria in the job description. Uh, so we just wanted to make sure that we updated this so that it is um, accurately represents what the employee will be doing. So this is not for a new position, this is for an existing position just to change what to add some of the duties. Okay. Yeah. And are they aware of these? This change? We don't have anybody in that position. Right. Oh, so it's oh. not somebody's not in the position. Correct. But it's not a new position. It's not a new position. I thought you just said who the person that's been doing the job that it didn't fit their job description. No, for people that have been in the position, oh, okay. it does not fit what they are what they're doing. Okay. So then in as part of our hiring to fulfill the position, we want to make sure that the um, position description is accurate, so they aren't essentially misled when they come in and start doing the job duties. Correct. If they come in and think they're only doing accounts receivable and being the receptionist, um, but then they're required to learn all the procurement laws, um, that's, I think that's not an accurate representation of what the job actually is. Okay. Any additional questions? I will go ahead and move that we approve the new job.
job description for the accounts specialist, accounts receivable, and procurement position. Second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion passes. We then have another job description. This one is for instructional coach. Superintendent Glass. Uh, so this is one of the positions that I shared with you um, when we discussed the ESSER 3 grant. Uh, it, this is an opportunity for us to have someone to be uh, teacher mentors, provide professional development that is job embedded and not general for teachers, um, as well as to provide support for beyond textbooks and PBIS within the classroom. And just to um, make sure that we have it on the record, this uh, position being funded through that ESSER grant is uh, unless we would find alternate funding after the two years um, of the, the ESSER grant being available to us or would be able to make a place in our budget to pay for this person, it's just a temporary position essentially. It's a two-year position. Any other questions or comments? Do we have a motion? I move the board approve the new job description for the instructional coach. Second. You have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion carries. We now have another job description. This one is for the behavior interventionist. Um, this is a kind of similar uh, superintendent glass, uh, correct, that this is funded through ESSER, so this would also be essentially a, a temporary two-year position unless we found additional funding to extend it beyond that. Correct. Um, any other background or information you'd like to provide us on this uh, behavior interventionist position? So this, um, this position would support uh, all children across the district. Uh, we have found over the past year that um, many of our students are not special education and are having behavior issues um, in school. And so this person would be able to support our classroom teachers with interventions and assistance to help with um, students having difficulty in school. So my question, the supervision received is the principal, but they would be at all three schools. Mm -hmm. So would all three principals be overseeing their work? How would that like evaluating their just, performance? Having and, worked with in having your time split among lots of people, I would just I think that might get tricky. Um, I'm not opposed to it, but I just want to throw that out there. Um, it is a district position, and each three of the, the three principals will be overseeing the, the work of the behavior interventionist. Um, so at each individual school, they'll receive supervision from the principal, but it is part of the educational services department. Um, and the interventionist, as well as the instructional coaches, would be assigned a certain percentage of their time at each of the schools. We don't want them to be district positions because we don't want them in the district office. We want them in the schools helping kids um, and teachers. And so um, we can work out the supervisory um, concern that you have, um, but that is uh, right now that's um, how we have it structured, but we can take a look at that. I mean, I think it's fine. I just, yeah. No, that does make it kind of confusing because it just says principal, and then it's like, so who do I report to? Who do, who's my boss? Like, no, it's my day <laughs> to have a <laughs> um, it's tough having three bosses. Yeah. But I do I do truly one hundred percent want to say I believe that the principal should be the one guiding this person because they're the ones who are the students best. Yes. So it's not it has nothing to do with they should oversee the work. Mm -hmm. They're part of the work and mentor the process. I just um, want to make sure that this person doesn't come in and feels like they, they're being filled in three different directions. Yeah, I think clear expectations need to be, you know, laid out that um, what what each principal expects and what the um, what the person is going to report back. Yeah, like, 
who, you know, what they're reporting to each principal. So I, I just think that needs to be really clear. Will that be included in the PBIS and the MPSS process? So um, they'll be working with that data and that system um, with students so that um, they would be working with the building level teams as well. So, um, and that is individualized by each student, the information that they gather and what they do. So there's no educational requirements for this job? You have to have intervention, a uh, behavior interventionist, yes. Is that here? Did I miss that? Yeah, it says behavior specialist education or experience. So under a minimum of five years successful right classroom teaching right. or right. right. um, year in which the teaching of at risk and or behaviorally challenged students was an important responsibility for that position. Yeah, I was, I was thinking in a different level or a different area than special education. Um, it is it is within special education. It is. Okay. But then um, there are other um, um, educational staff that do have the um, under like um, school psychology um, behavior interventionist, the behavior interventionist um, certificate. That's you know, other certificates. I mean, this is a broad based job, um, and. I don't know that it's going to be that easy to find somebody that's got you know eight different certificates in sociology and all the other elements of this job. Um, I just want to make sure that um, we don't close the door to people that can do a good job because we put too much in there. On the other hand, I don't want to be accused of bringing somebody in that's um, that's underqualified from an educational um, professional standpoint. Mm -hmm. Right, I mean, that's why we list for experience, because some um, special education teachers and some general education teachers have experience working in um, behavior programs and um, may have exceptional training. So um, that, that is why we list experience as well. Any additional questions? Do we have a motion? Or do we want to table this? No, I don't think so. I recommend that the board approve the new job description for the behavior interventionists. I will second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. Aye. Any opposition? All right, the motion passes. Uh, we now have uh, the action item of third party custodial for FHMS. Superintendent Glass, are you going to uh, speak to us? Uh, I do see Mr. Flynn is in the audience. Is he going to come up and yes, share? Sir. Yes, Mr. Flynn will be Thank you. us to discuss this. Good evening. Good evening, Madam President. Uh, thanks to everybody, Governing Board and Superintendent Glass, for the opportunity to come and speak to you about uh, third party custodial service at the middle school. You have questions from there, or do you want me to cut like I'll start you yeah. <laughs> we've, we've given you this amazing opportunity to speak with us. I'm very excited. You even brought a family. This is only hour 14 of my work. It's all good. I still have an hour left before I have to be home. So I, I submitted my questions, and I know you answered them, but I obviously I would rather them be answered in public. So I, I guess I have two concerns on this. One is that it's just for the middle school when we hear several complaints out of all three schools. And so I don't want the middle school or the other schools to feel like the middle school is being favored. And um, I, when I asked the question, I was told it's because the, the custodial staff is fully filled at the elementary and at the high school. But based on teacher comments, that's not true. Um, and then the hourly wage concerns for an outside contractor compared to what we're paying our custodians. So can you talk about those two things first? All right, I'll take the, uh, the, the first question first, uh, whether we're fully staffed at the elementary school and the high school. At the high school, um, based on the numbers that I was provided, uh, we are fully staffed. There is a, a lead custodian, and there are three custodians who work uh, under him. So that, that it, it is my understanding of being fully staffed there. Um, is that, uh, does that mean that we're still under service there? Um, 
frankly, if I look at FMX, and that's my way of measuring um, you know, what is being done or what isn't being done, that's the feedback I get from teachers and staff at the, uh, the high school. The high school has the least number of FMX requests for facilities, by far. I mean, it's, it's not even close um, to the second most, which is the middle school. The elementary school has the most requests, by far. Um, is the middle is is the elementary school fully staffed? It is, but it, it's it's fully staffed because we support the the elementary school with two. Um, people from transportation every day. Um, I can tell you the comments that I've had from staff who've been there for a while who've talked to me about it is the buildings ever look better to them in terms of, of, of being taken care of. Um, I take that always with a grain of salt because I think some people say that just to be to be nice and to, to offer uh, me some encouragement. <laughs> on days when I'm, I'm feeling it, and I appreciate that, um, but I think you know, we could always do better. But, but overall, the, the building is in much better shape than it was two years ago, for sure, uh, in terms of how we take care of it. Before you answer uh, question number two, I just wanted to get some additional clarification um, in your response that you gave to us. So when you say it's, it's fully staffed, like, what calculation is that based on? Like, do we have some kind of square footage model that for like every X square footage we would need X number of custodial headcount to make sure that we are adequately serviced? That, yeah, that's a great question. So at the high school, we do use a per square foot calculation based on what the expectation is um, each day that needs to be accomplished by, yeah. by the staff. Um, and that calculation uh, comes out to four point, and again, you know, I can send everybody an email with something. Yeah, no, I just but wanted to know that it wasn't like a gut feeling that there's like actual. <laughs> I, I try not to do anything on a gut <laughs> feeling. <laughs> if I do things on a gut feeling, it never turns out right. I think the last time I used the word gut feeling in this uh, in this chamber, <laughs> somebody mentioned it to me later. <laughs> anyway. Um, no, it's, I, I, I believe it's somewhere between uh, 4.1 and 4.2. I, I want to say 4.23. So are, are we off by a quarter person if we are? Got it. Um, as far as the middle school goes, uh, the middle school, uh, as long as I've been here, and even before I took over facilities, has never been fully staffed. Um, it, currently, it, there's, uh, there, there's a lead person uh, has resigned and is leaving as of Friday, and there is a swing shift person that comes in who has no flexibility in their schedule. You know, it's either swing shift or, or can't work at all. With that being said, uh, I, I think that those two guys have done a, 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 a pretty decent job of, of keeping that building up to, uh, up to speed. The idea behind bringing third party into one school to start with is A, I just feel like this is something new for us. Like we've not tried it before. It's, it's like uh, landscaping services, right? Do we want to hire you know, four landscapers, or do we want to hire two and see how it works out? Do we want to do this across the board at, at all of our schools? Or you know, given the fact that the, the lead custodian is resigning, this gives us an opportunity to beta test something that I think we were considering for next year anyway. So it gives us an opportunity to beta test it and see if it works out. And that's why um, the middle school. A, the, the short, it's not fully staffed, and B, it's just an opportunity to beta test something we're considering uh, for district-wide going forward. So at McDonough Mountain, you said that there's two that you um, send over there from transportation. Yes. So I'm assuming they go after their bus routes? Yes, they, they work between uh, their bus routes, right? Okay. And what is their job over there? Like, are they just in charge of maintenance? Are they actually in charge of cleaning the bathrooms? Like, who's cleaning, I guess, is, is my right. biggest concern. So they do, they'll do anything that's been assigned to them, and they, they have daily assignments. Is there anything from cleaning the bathrooms to vacuuming the halls? Um, they're also the people who will respond to FM requests. Uh, 
or teachers have specific requests to come in back in my room, whatever it may be. Um, they do not get involved in actual maintenance, like fixing uh, uh, light sockets or repairing these things. They, they don't get involved in any of that. They, uh, they do just primarily, uh, uh, they have a schedule that they follow, and they clean the bathrooms, they clean the bathrooms. And how much do they make now, or do they make now? Um, they make, uh, yeah, those, those two make, yeah, they, 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 they work on their, their bus wage, which is $18 now. That, that's just their wage. That's not their rolled up, you know, ER cost. That's, and the ER cost meaning what? Um, that would be the cost uh, uh, we actually pay them per hour, uh, plus all of the benefits that the school district, including ta taxes and benefits, that the school district has to uh, provide in addition to their base salary. So while the base salary may be eighteen dollars, uh, uh, as a rule of thumb here in this district, uh, the uh, the adder is about one point three one on top of that to uh, to have the rolled up cost of, of their per hour. That's interesting. So picking up on a couple of weeks ago when we talked about McDonald's, um, I like the idea of making. Uh, an effort to be flexible in terms of maintenance in, in our current situation with three campuses. Um, when we go to two campuses, it's going to require less um, hope, at least maintenance people in total, because we won't uh, have those days when we have a short shortage of people in one day and then two days later we're, we're sitting around maybe. I know that doesn't happen much. But my point is, I think we have to look at custodial when it comes to working with two campuses instead of three as a point of safety. Just saying. Was there a question or? That's just a purely a comment. <laughs> <laughs> right. So basically, hiring an outside company means when we go, when we decrease our schools, we won't have to let people go because people are clamoring for these jobs. <laughs> but um, I think that the point is being made that it gives us more flexibility in terms of discontinuing a contract as opposed to... It, it, do, it does give us more flexibility, and uh, with the company that we're contemplating using, um, they also guarantee you that you'll have staff every day. Um, the, the ideal is that the staff that you get every, you know, on a regular basis is the same staff. Right. It, you know, they become familiar with students and, and staff and everyone else. But in the event that somebody is not feeling well or they have vacation time, they take full responsibility for making sure that, that uh, if those people are off or sick, that that slot is filled. And, and I would say, that I, I do want to, I, I think it's important to make this uh, part of the public record. Um, I don't contemplate having to let any of our current staff go. I think we can repurpose them. Um, they've, they've got great skills. They've been here a long time. They, they, they know that the campus, I think we can repurpose them, um, you know, if not in custodial staff, in, in other areas of the school where they could be helpful. Because we can certainly use more people in transportation, for example, and some of those people would, would I, I think, would step up and, and be willing to come over to transportation. Well, in the custodial piece, it's just custodial, not maintenance, correct? Yeah, it's, it's not, it is not maintenance. Right, so, so if some of those individuals we might retain for maintenance positions. Correct, we, we could be, there are, there are one and a half of them that have, what I would say. <laughs> and, 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 yeah, and, and I think the half could learn to, to be a, a whole as well, that have the basic skills to do wiring, to fix plumbing, uh, to repair carpeting, to change door handles, all the all those things, uh, which you know currently is done. It's Michigan's it, it gets it all done at this point. So I'm, I'm sorry. It's um, kind of uh, throw it against the wall and hope it sticks. <laughs> well, I guess my other concern is so, the contracted you, price. Yes, the, the contract price. So I, I believe um, that I. The, the roll-up cost, the average, not including the two high, the, the two building leads, uh, which are, uh, am I allowed to mention their names? 
the, 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 there's two building leads here. There was one at the middle school and one here at the high school. Their salary is not included in that. So uh, I believe that the rolled up average hourly cost is uh, like $23 and change. So we're talking, and again, every dollar counts, um, but we're, we're, we're talking about, I think at the end of the day, if we, we, we plan this in, and, and uh, structure it properly, uh, the custodians that we do uh, hire through a third party service will either be uh, nine or 10 month employees. Um, and the reason I say that is because two years ago, well, it's now three years ago with COVID, uh, we were really successful at getting teachers who were looking for additional pay um, and, and other staff members who are involved in doing like summer maintenance and summer cleaning um, and so forth. So I, I think that's another way to offer, you know, staff that we do have another avenue to make some additional money. And um, per the contract, uh, we would be signing a one-year contract, but we are able to cancel without uh, pause uh, with 30 days notice, which basically means we have to still execute the contract with them for another 30 days and then we'd be Right, and that, that's standard on Yeah, no, right. You began that with uh, something that uh, typically happened. Y yes, um, when I I've not seen the contract yet. If it's in my email, maybe I'll get to it on Saturday. <laughs> um, but no, I I was just making it a matter of record that right. it is a one-year contract, but we don't have to execute the full one year. Right. So if it doesn't work out for well, some reason, we well, can cancel. If the contract is. Uh, uh, 1 February 2022 to 31 January 2023, I'm, I'm not going to accept that. So if, if that contract comes to me, their contract is going to be from, again, I'm making up the start date, February yes. 1, but the end date is going to be June 30 of this year. I mean, we're not going to get into a long-term contract. And then have to switch mid It, it defeats year. the purpose of, of using it as a beta. That's a good point as well. Any additional questions or comments? Sounds like we're set with our discussion. So I will go ahead and move that we uh, authorize a contract with Delta T Group for the third party custodial services for FHMS. I second it. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor of the motion on the table, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? I'm a no. Okay, thank you. Our next action item is the uh, Fountain Hills Pickleball Facilities Use Agreement. Superintendent Glass, uh, is there anything that you want to share with us on this? Um, no, nothing additionally, uh, except for that they did just have to update their insurance and then wanted a new agreement. Uh, and so uh, they've been leasing this facility from us for over 10 years and we um, would like to continue to do that. If you agree. Any questions or comments? Do we have a motion? I recommend that the board approve the five-year facility usage agreement for the pickleball club. I will second. All those in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? The motion passes. Uh, next, we have information and discussion items. Superintendent Glass? Um, and so, as, as we go through these items, I, um, while you cannot make decisions in order for us to um, write um, action items uh, and bring this before you for official vote, I need to get your opinions on what it is that you'd like to do. Um, and so, as we go through these, that would be incredibly helpful. Um, I talked with you last year about um, increasing the main building principal to uh, 12 months instead of 11 month employees. Um, the athletic director, uh, the athletic director is half AD, half dean. 
um, but having that position during the summer when there should be planning and meetings and things that she or he needs to go to would be really helpful. There's so much work that they do during the summer that um, we really could um, take advantage of that time um, um, for that person. Um, and then the, the counselors would like to decrease their calendar from um, 11 to 10.5 months uh, and feel like they should be able to um, cover, and it's really just the high school principals that right now are, are 11 months. The counselors, you mean? Yeah, counselors, excuse me. Um, they feel like they can get all of their work completed and um, be ready for the school year in that amount of time. So any um, thoughts or feedback or ideas about any of those or questions that you might have? Um, I have a comment about the counselor. I'll just tell you as a former high school parent, that concerns me. Um, it's really difficult in the summer to get a hold of anybody. And we get kids that are, are changing classes, that are newly registered, and all of a sudden it becomes like, you know, the week before school or the week of school, and all of a sudden now there's all these requests for schedule changes and things like that. So I don't see how shortening their contract makes sense over the summer when you know things still happen and, and now there's no one to service the kids like who's going to take care of that is there somebody that's going to be on call to change schedules yeah I, excuse me i would like to hear from the principal to see if he thinks that is a workable solution or if uh, he has other suggestions where we meet the needs that Jill just talked about um, having come in in July, I wasn't there to experience, you know, May or beginning of June, if you will. Um, but I can speak from other schools I've been at. Um, I, I do agree with that. I mean, I, I understand that, you know, depending on who the counselor is, he or she may want more of a summer or may feel like they can they can get their work done. Um, I'd like to see how this year goes with all due respect in terms of being there in the thick of it um, after graduation and, and what happens the week after and what kind of requests we get but um, I do agree with Jill in that um, the first the week before school is uh, controlled chaos if you will. <laughs> and, uh, and certainly a lot happens during that week so um, I think it, it often depends on the individual or the individuals, what they can get done and, and how, frankly, good they are. Um, some can handle more than others. Some like to spread the work out. Um, I will say uh, with the counselors uh, that, that we had last year, it, it uh, seemed to be very efficient. Uh, and, and, but I, I also think it depends on who's in the role. Yeah, and I guess just going to attend, like, you know, right now, I guess typically the counselors are gone, like, the month of July or whatever. I don't know. But, um, you know, so if they go to 10 and a half months, let's just say that their summer starts June 1st, that means they don't come back until July 15th. So, you know, maybe that could work, but um, then you don't have any counselors during the summer school area, you know, like as school's wrapping up when kids are maybe needing transcripts still. I mean, there's a lot that goes on. And so I'm really worried about that time frame. You know, the middle of June now takes them till the end of July. So then they're not coming back till the 1st of August. That, that I, I don't know. I, I mean, we just went through this as a high school parent. So I, that, that's just concerning to me. So I get it, they want a longer summer, but that's kind of the job of the high school counselor. Um, they currently are um, finished the end of the second week of June and don't come back until the um, when the principals come back the third or fourth week of um, July. Um, so they already have that significant amount of time um, off. They don't help with summer school. Um, and in the past, we've had um, the data specialist that would help with, and the registrar that helps with transcripts and course changes and those types of things during the summer. 
but even that person is hard to get a hold of unless you know how to get a hold of them. So I'm not an advocate of it. Sorry. I mean, I don't want to penalize our counselors because we don't have because we don't have staff that knows how to pull transcripts, right? Yeah. Um, so I think that well, then maybe it's a communication issue. Yeah, and so maybe it's you know we need to think about who needs to be around in the summer for certain activities that have to happen because just. I mean, we're penalizing a counselor because they're really good and we know they're going to do what we need them to do to switch our classes and to fix things. Um, you know, they they deserve some time off. So is it the principal? Is it who else? Like, how do roles and responsibilities fall for? What is the, you know, maybe that's part of it too. Like, yeah, you graduate, you have to send your transcript to your college so that they know you have it. I can tell you right now, maybe there is something out there. But like, I, when do I get that? Do I get that the day after graduation? Do I ask, it? you know what I mean? If it's just maybe. Okay, well, I, and I even look, and I don't even listen. So it's an online request system. It was that the canvas, the transcript, the paper yes. mill thing uh, or something. The, the parchment. 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 Right. Um, but you have to pay for that one. You do. Um, but I would just say that's where I think my concern is, is that, yes, we need someone to be able to do those things, but are the counselors the only ones that can that can do those things? Because I don't want to, literally, it's almost like we're penalizing them for doing their job well. Well, and maybe having the principal then be a 12-month employee as opposed to um, an 11-month employee when the principals were all gone during July as well. <clears throat> like, there just wasn't a lot of office staff. I mean, the high school office literally closes. Mm -hmm. So... That's, I, I just don't like that, you know, that there's nobody that, that parents can talk to if you're trying to register your kid, trying to get transcripts, um, and the diplomas don't even come out until the middle of June. We do have central registration coming up. Yeah, so maybe that's uh, maybe an that area be. where that can help us cover uh, the gaps in July. And then, so, and then principals, what is typical out of the school districts? Is it 12 months, 11 months? What is, um, what is typical? Um, Mr. Hartman or Mr. Alexander, can you answer? Yeah, the typical contract length for, I would say, all principals, regardless of elementary, middle, or high, is 12 months. And then, if it moves from an 11 month to a 12 month, should they also get an increase in um, time off? Uh, so their leave switches. So they get additional days? Um, so yeah, they get the additional, um, they, get, they go back to getting, um, I think in the past they had vacation days versus general leave days, and they had sick days. So um, that is how theirs is delineated just like mine. So do they get like slightly more days then than they get as an 11? Yes. But obviously not so many that they could basically take the month of July off and just make it a new point uh, with, with switching from 11 months to 12 months. Right. No. Um, but I wanted to ask them, like, what is, um, in your experience, counselors' um, contract months in other districts? Um, Scottsdale, uh, it was week before and week after. They were there a week before and week after school. Um, they usually uh, had them, you know, graduation was like it is here, May 25th, 26th, 27th. They were until June 2nd or 3rd, and then they came back um, August 1st through the 4th, and the school started on the 11th. So, but we had five counselors, I mean, you know, so different, different dynamic. Yeah. Um, but, but it was that at a larger school? Yeah. So, I mean, are we comparing apples to apples with, uh, you know, counselor-student ratios? Yeah, I mean, it was, uh, well, the ratios were probably similar, given okay. that you had, you know, more kids but more counselors. Right. Um, so that that was, we're not comparing apples to apples in terms of school size, but right. ratios, right. yes. Um, but as long as I was there, it was roughly week before and week after school. And were the responsibilities similar to our counselors, like are your were those counselors in charge of scheduling and everything? Yeah, so schedule requests were traditionally handled during those times. Um, and then when we did have summer school, 
the district hired a summer school counselor who was there, got a stipend for that, and was there. It was somebody who wanted to make extra money and wanted to work summer school. So. I would also add to it, it, it varies, you know, district to district as far as the length of a contract for counselors. I've seen them as short as nine and a half months to as as large as like 11 months, um, which we currently have. to speak with a group of superintendents at the uh, 
um, fall ASBA conference, the law conference, um, that are employing J some J1 um, visa teachers and are having really great success with them with teaching um, our children. And so I wanted to um, get your feedback about your willingness to move forward with that or your concerns or thoughts about that at all. You know, I've had some experience with that and it's been mixed. Mm -hmm. um, and it depends on their language is the number one thing that usually gets in the way of their success or lack of language in some cases. Um, but uh, you run into situations of equity and pay sometimes as well because um, much of the J-1 visas in education have been used to reduce costs. Yeah, but we're in a different situation now, certainly with the demand uh, far exceeding the supply of, of qualified faculty. But um, making sure that they still meet the requirements for certificates and highly qualified instructors, I think, is a challenge. And I haven't been directly involved for a couple of years now, but that's those are the concerns that I would have. And I've had, in my nine years on the board, I've never heard of this or has anyone brought it to my attention? So mm -hmm. this is new for me. I would assume that, you know, we would put them through the same type of, uh, you know, hiring um, screening process and they would be required to meet the same criteria. So I don't feel mm -hmm. like we should dismiss them out of hand stuff. just because of the visa status. Right. It's an option. Yeah, right about that stuff, and it says that they have to have a bachelor's degree. Right, right. Yeah. yeah, I think it's an opportunity that's certainly worth looking at. Yes. I agree with that as well. Anything else about the J-1 visa item? Okay, we can move on to Central Register. I um, have been um, discussing with some of our district office staff the possibility of us having a central registration um, where parents can come to one location, take care of all of their paperwork, um, enter their information into um, enrollment at school and or in enrollment express, um, where we can make sure that we have all of the copies of the birth certificates and the um, verifications of address and the immunizations and that um, we have specific people that are taking care of um, ensuring that everything is entered correctly into power school. Um, between um, Mr. Alexander, Ms. Mrs. Andre, myself, and Mr. Wright, over the last four months, we have been working to make corrections to power school so that we ensure that our data is correct when it's pulled to ADE. Um, that's of course, as you know, how we get our funding, and we just really felt like this would be a really good opportunity for us to centralize services for our families, um, because we do have families that have kiddos in each school, and so they've got to go to each school to register and get things taken care of when they could just come to one location and take care of that. Um, we, um, this uh, group would, um, they would be the ones that would handle the entries into power school, make sure that all of the reporting data is there and correct, um, and making sure that all of our students' HUME files when they begin with us are correct. So when we get new students, um, everything would be in there. As you remember last year um, in, I think, August or, Sept or no, September, October, we had an attendance audit where they found that many of our students didn't have complete files. Um, they didn't have birth certificates. They didn't have, and while we've improved on that using um, Enrollment Express, um, we do still have some students that were missing their information. Uh, and so um, we did utilize this in um, Sierra Vista. It was really a great system. People could come to, again, one location to um, get their students registered for school and um, get moving um, in our district. So, just thoughts about that? Yeah, I vouch for that wholeheartedly. We, uh, 
community college level with the 10 colleges we had 10 independently managed and operated administrations and they first came on the board there 10 to 12 years ago uh, and over that course of time we now have the ability to have a student get online and register for classes at any of the 10 colleges and get one transcript instead of you know as many as they signed up for and i think we're at a size here where uh, we can make a one-stop registration center uh, in your district office or any other place that's most convenient for parents to and their students to go especially when they move here in the summer mm -hmm. um, they can always uh, you know between the working hours of day walk in the door and walk away with their kids solidly registered and more importantly as you said we have all the information that we mm -hmm. need we're not playing catch up because so i couldn't come in that day and we did it over the phone but i don't have the paperwork so now they can they can make it a one-stop center where they can walk in the door and walk out with everything that they need to get those kids you know, started whenever that happens whether it's in the summer or the middle of the year but can get yeah, I like the consistency of it that pretty much the same people will be entering the information just like on our enrollment report. It's kind of, you know, hit or miss as to what information you're getting. So just like with enrollment, I would hope that withdrawals would have the same, that now it, it would say, you know, where the student went when they withdrew, you know, that I, I like the consistency of the same person kind of doing it or the same group. Team yeah. yeah. Yeah, so I'm on board. I think it makes sense. My question is about using existing staff to fill the two positions we would need to have for the work. Does that mean we would be pulling staff from our schools? Where would, who are the, who are these existing staff that would fill these positions? So every school has a registrar. Um, McDowell Mountain and the high school have dedicated registrars while their middle school shares um, their secretaries and administrative assistants um, share those responsibilities. Uh, to get registrations done, um, and so, so we would let, they would no longer have that responsibility to be centralized. So yeah. then the two separate registrars would move to the district office, yes. essentially. Yes. So they're not going to. The, their positions aren't being eliminated. They're just being moved yeah. to the district office. Correct. And does that does that require additional people in the the high school and work down mountain to assist with other duties as needed? Um, they typically just do their duties as registrars. Um, I know that the registrar at the high school does help the counselors with um, some things, but, um, and that doesn't mean that they, they can't continue to do that. I think that also helps because um, in Sierra Vista, they did do transcripts in the summer for kids. They were able to take care of some things. Um, not class changes, because that really is up to the counselor, particularly when we get to the high school level. Um, but they are able to contact the building principal and make sure that the students get assigned teachers and uh, at the middle school and the elementary level. And um, it really does um, expedite the process when we get to the fall. Uh, again, since the principals are all sitting here, <laughs> this, this, or this. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll speak for, for our building. Uh, Michelle and Steph handle most of the registrations that come in, and I would say each one, as you're chasing down forms and, and calling parents back to get them to correct things, is a Three plus hour process, and so they would they would welcome that in a heartbeat because between chasing down close contacts and registrations and this and that, there, there'll be very little time for them to do what what we hired them to do. So it would it would be great for the middle school level. Thank you. I I, I think it's a great idea. I think uh, from a parent standpoint, going to you know if we happen to have got a bit. Kids in all three Bobcat schools right now, if they go to all three to register your kids, what are you going to do with the little one that's sitting there crying her eyes out because this is the third school she's been in and he's had it? Well, I will just comment that, you know, moving into this district, 
um, in uh, 2016 after having been in two other states and two other school districts. I went to the district office and they looked at me like I was a crazy person, like, why are you here to register your kids for school? I'm like, this is the district office, right? Yes, but we don't do that here. And I was like, that just seems impossible to me. That's what you're supposed to do at the district office. <laughs> Well, and in facto, y'all have to they had a central location, right, for enrollment. Correct. Yeah. So you're right. It, it's kind of an oddity here. Mm -hmm. so, but I think, you know. It's really always done. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> McDowell always had kindergarten roundup where they registered all the kindergartners. So. They can still do that. Yeah, they, can. they, they do can still, still do that. that. Well, no, he said they could still do that. Yeah. Like, even if they we had. Well, I know they do not, but if they had central <laughs> registration. They so could still they, do they could still do kindergarten. Yeah, I think it's just them communicating that to families. Right. Yes. Yeah. They, they could go to the district office and have kindergarten. Or, or district office can go to McDowell. They can yes. do that too. Yes. Yeah. We're versatile. Like <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the next item is facilities. Uh, so I'm going to ask Mr. Flynn to come back up to um, answer some more of your questions. Should you have some? Um, we really are getting down to like a crunch time, uh, especially if you want um, or are interested in having McDowell Mountain closed at the end of this school year and students move to the middle school and the high school. Um, we are um, getting to a significant time crunch um, and money crunch at this point, and so. Um, Mr. Flynn and I did provide to you in December a proposed timeline for the possible closure of McDowell Mountain, which would give us a two-year time frame to get things moved and um, items retrofitted and um, repaired and technology installed and all of those things. Um, but in order to provide a, um, an action item for you, I need to know um, which way you are interested in going. Um, you can see from the information again that we provided you, same thing from last, um, from December, the, um, on the very first page uh, where it talks about the overall operating cost for each of the school sites um, per year. Um, everything at Down Mountain costs $116,981. Um, and um, Mr. Flynn can speak with you about um, the cost of what it would be to um, close McDowell Mountain at the end of the school year and um, open or and, and then move everyone versus a two year time frame of um, being able to prepare and move. And I just wanted to ask so the 160000 Some of that. I, I do think we can save some money when it comes to spreading out the work, just like we are with the right now, with our previous discussion. And we're consolidating into two facilities, and if you do it on square footage, do we need the same amount of custodial help and, and maintenance, if that's, that's certainly part of it, that we would if we had uh, substantially less square footage. So I, I, I just want to make sure those are part of the equation. But as far as the whole facility, you know where I stand. I think, yeah. uh, I, I think you all are being ridiculously optimistic um, and that we could get everything in place. I mean, with the, with the shortage in labor and how are we going to get a little bathrooms made and furniture? Optimistic and, about the time frame we're getting turned around by? If we are going to retrofit the middle school for our littles, mm -hmm. you really think it's going to be able to be done the first month in August. Of oh, this year? Yes. No, I was on record last time saying as much as I would like. Well, I, I, these, I agree with Mr. Sarr. You know, I'd like to have it done. 
Okay, then these dates. Wait, then I'm confused about these dates. There's, it goes through 2025. And then where is the... Okay, so 2022-23. It's just preparing the high school for the middle school. So you are moving... Okay, so you're talking about closing... So, okay, why are we talking about closing it? Okay, I'm confused then. 24-25, move pre-K with their grade students to the middle school. So that's another three years. I think that's one. I, I, there's some options, especially for the ones that really need bachelor modifications, which are kindergartners and preschoolers. Um, yeah, there, there, there is no doubt we can't get around that. that yeah. And I think there's some options uh, that are available to us uniquely at this point with facilities that we currently don't own. But um, rumor has it that they're interested in leasing them to us that are currently or have been used for preschool and kindergarten in the past. So they're modified for those age groups already. There's a, that's the group that's going to be the hardest uh, to, to meet the needs of the facilities. So we, we have that possibility. Um, and then the McDonald Mountain uh, closing will move uh, those four grades uh, first and fourth um, into the middle school and we move Six. Uh, oh, really um, so, tell me how we move. So, it, yeah, then you go back first, second, and third left at McDowell that we need to move. Is it feasible, though, to move all of McDowell by the start of the school year 2023? Um, it, it's definitely more feasible than by the beginning of the. <laughs> the coming. I'm sorry. I was doing communication, and my mind was like, this is <laughs> Here, I was so I apologize. I was literally reading the words, but they were not in the of my head. Oh, yeah. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, right. You know, things need to be retrofitted. You know, and there is a supply issue, there's a labor issue. But you know, I just, I just think that to do it through the board of twenty five, that's a long time still that we're paying on a building that needs a lot of work. You're talking about the yes. yes, yes. So if we could. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so but that may be part of the equation. It might be. Yeah. 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 Y
might be. I think that if we can, just to say to somebody, hey, we're going to move to a school that's falling apart, even though on the outside it looks fine, to a beautiful school that is going to have the latest and greatest because we now have a million dollars to use in capital expenditures because we sold a piece of land. I say, if we're going to do it, we go big. I mean, I think that this is an opportunity. We're sitting on pieces of land. People want land right now. Why are we not taking advantage of this land to do the capital improvements? The only thing we can spend on is the capital. Yeah, so here's our opportunity to take down the TVs from 20 years ago in the classrooms at the middle school. Like it's the new lighting. And why are we going to do it half ass? Let's, sorry, <laughs> language. Let's if we're going to do it, we need to create a space that's beautiful. I'm serious. I'm being no, serious. Right. I, I, I think I think that has to be part of the conversation. Yeah. Like we're we're always struggling to find money. We know where we have money. We know how we can invest the money to make we're talking about the property values are ridiculous yeah. right now. Yeah. So we're, so talking we're talking about collapsing the district. So why would we retain land for an expansion that is unlikely to come? That no, it, it's sense. just always been held as an asset for a rainy day. Yeah. Yeah. So property values are at top dollar right now. I'm not sure you're going to see them much higher than where they're at now. Mm -hmm. I know real estate agents would love to think they're going to continue to grow, but eventually they're going to pop. Yeah. So that's why I think as we think about these discussions and we talk about parents and I'm, I'm, Yeah, and I'm all for putting for sale signs on tomorrow morning. I'll be making yeah. the night for the <laughs> For sale by John. I, 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 I agree 100%. That, that expansion is unlikely. It's too, yeah, right? it's um, depending on, on, on what we do ultimately with McDowell Mountain or Four Peaks, we still have two school buildings we could move back into for less money than building uh, new buildings. Fix them. And there is no doubt in my mind um, that, that, right the, 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 what we, the premium we can get today for land uh, is not going to be available to us a year from now. Or five years from now. This anomaly that, that is being driven by COVID is not going to be here forever. And I've been the holdout on selling the land. I've said that for a long time. It was like a rainy day fund. So, but I agree with you. Like, if we're ever going to sell it, probably now because mm -hmm. I've, I mean, I've, I've lived here since 1984 and I've never seen property values where they're at now, ever. And we can make well, it's plasters, you can have out outdoor areas for learning, and I mean, we can have the best of the best of the best. We can have STEM rooms. We can have everything that we really want, because we're talking about moving kids, and that in and of itself is a rough transition. So if we are going to create a great space, let's do it. Additional safety of things. You know what I mean? Like, there's and all energy efficiency. Yeah, so you can put yeah. money toward teachers. So the, 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 when I was here last time, um, I was asked, uh, you know, how much you know, I think it would make cost to make the move by August. To give the logistics of whether we can actually fit, you know, 20 pounds into a five pound can. Yes. Um, and I said $2 million just to make the move. Um, I spent, not knowing that I was going to speak about this, <laughs> I spent the last couple weeks um, uh, during my break, uh, before I went on break, and then the last week, talking to some of my contacts about uh, magnitude of cost, given, 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 right? And it comes out to 1.73, 1.763 million dollars. Sure is so close. I have no doubt. Listen, I, again, I've made 200,000 dollars mistakes before the I didn't pay for it. So, um, anyway, so it, 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 it's still a big number, but yes, I, I think that if we said if, if we need to take the time now, quickly, to put together what the plan yeah, looks like. Look. And, that, and that master plan does include talking about selling the land, what do we upgrade immediately, what, do, what goes out to bond, what can be done with school facilities for. All of that is something we should be committing on and, and sitting and talking about, so that when it does come to public this discussion, um, you know, as many parties have been involved, you know, as many stakeholders have been involved as possible, um, so, because that's what's going to build the ground swell with, like everybody says, it's, this is a tough transition. McDowell Mount, I've said this before, McDowell Mount is a lovely school. It is, it is, you know, I go there and it just, it, it fits the kids perfectly. 
this is an emotional thing as much as it is a uh, a, a fiscal uh, a, a monetary thing and I, I just think we need to build a, a consensus from the ground up but, but like building in China we don't have a lot of time you know we're not we don't have four years to build a, a skyscraper here. We have a year to build a skyscraper. And we just need to start now. And if we have money at our disposal, it makes it a yes. lot easier to get the things and, that and, we want. And right, and think about, think about, and I mean this sincerely, think about the, the public relations that it does where, where we're essentially selling off these assets and putting money in the basket when we go out for bond and ask for additional capital. Um, if it's part of a master plan, I, I think there's more buy-in when, when people see that, hey, we were willing to you know, step up and we've come up with a plan with, with the buildings that we have left over to, to be able to get rid of this property and take some of the onus off the taxpayers and create a truly 21st century school. Yes. So it sounds like we have a work study session. Exactly. Hey, George, I don't think you realize what big deal this is. I think this is breaking news. <laughs> <laughs> they're talking about selling their $20 million property. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, the thing is, is those three properties that we have have to go on the ballot to yes. be selling them. Yes. I, I, know they're no, they're I can't imagine, I mean, who is against oh, us selling them? Oh, yeah. Well, this room is four. Yeah, it's four way stop is complicated. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and, and I understand. <laughs> you know, from, the, from neighbors' perspective, you know, right now, they have, they have this beautiful you know, wilderness that they look at in their backyards and the mountain lions run through it. And, <laughs> well, and maybe we just, sell, we just sell pieces of it and give them a little bit of the, the, sooner, <laughs> the sooner, and again, I don't need another thing on my plate, but the sooner we do this, the better, we, better, the, the, the better argument we have and the better plan we have going forward to, to, to turn this into a 21st century school that often that 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 I think we you know we made strides to be able to sell this district sell as part of when we were in education. But uh to, to promote this district and, and, and drive attendance up, there would be nothing better than when I'm 90 years old to see that we've opened up those two other schools because there's so many kids in, in town. So uh, we have our study session on the 26th. I think this is a good start to that exactly. to talk about the land and what we decide to do with the land will give us a better timeline of what we're going to do with the schools. Yeah. And when you're done, I just, I just want to say one thing about, or are we done with that? Right. I'm not sure who my new colleague is. Have we met before? <laughs> have we? I, if we have, I apologize. Yeah. Um, the one thing I just I, I want to be clear about on supplies. Um, <laughs> Because he's got a legitimate, I mean, you know, every, anytime anybody has a criticism or, or uh, uh, an idea of how to do things better, I take that very seriously. Um, we've not changed anything in terms of how we get supplies to schools. Um, an FMX report uh, uh, goes from me, goes from any staff member um, to me directly. It gets assigned immediately by the end of, of that day or first thing in the morning before staff arrives so that uh, we can deliver supplies either that are already at the school building or because we do just in time, and I think I explained before why we do just in time because of the, the, the just the mess of uh, supplies when we switched over vendors, uh, which I'm trying to defend in the future. But we deliver same day um, if, if, the, if, the, if the, uh, the request comes in to us from the uh, whoever the lead custodian is. And those people are familiar with that process so one thing I take away from those comments, which I appreciate, is I do need to do a better job again of communicating how we how this works because there should be no more than a 24-hour lag time, unless we're out of something, which I would be surprised um, that we're out of something. But um, unless we're out of something, it, it's really a 24-hour lead time. So better than and, uh, <laughs> yeah, those poor guys. I drove home. I drove home. What night? Monday night, I think I drove home at halftime of the college national championship game because I was working and watching on my computer at the same time. And I counted five Amazon Prime trucks out working, two UPS trucks, and one FedEx truck. Now, just coming up uh, Palomino to uh, I mean, craziness, but anyway.
All right? Yeah. Is that yes. it? Yes, yes. All right. Thanks again for uh, your time. I appreciate Thank all you. of you. All right. Thanks. Thank you, John. Oh, I'm going to sing it as a mention. Um, I, I want to thank everybody for coming, but particularly my wife who came out Yeah, this is our date. Uh, <laughs> I'll be talking to him tomorrow. We go to Club for our date night, so I'll go monitoring of our federal grants this year. Um, I shared with you the letter, the determination letter. You can see that um, we were compliant in um, every grant, except for that the district has not had a, um, a policy on the completion of time and effort logs, as well as, what was the last one? Uh, it was time and effort logs, the removal of access, technology access, for staff that have um, access to the grants management enterprise on ADD. Uh, so we just have to add those two things into existing um, procedure, um, procedures, um, specifically into the tech use agreement, um, and then we'll be compliant. Uh, they do want us to change our travel policy reimbursement. So right now, um, if somebody brings your receipts, you reimburse them. They are recommending that we go back to the um, um, the per diem and allowable costs for um, expenses. So um, if that is something that you are interested in doing, then um, I'll need a little bit of time to research that and bring that with um, some of the other policies that we are uh, finishing up. So thoughts about that? Is, is there like logic behind why we would want to go to a per diem versus um, you know actuals that don't exceed an allowable amount? Um, so we don't really have anything that um, outlines what is exceeding an allowable amount. Um, if I um, wanted to buy a hundred dollar steak dinner and bring the receipts, if that was my dinner for when I was attending a conference, then you all would pay for that. And nobody does that. But um, the policy doesn't prohibit it. Correct. Correct. And and if, most districts have the pretty you know, uh, you know, so much for breakfast, so much for lunch, so much for dinner. You've got to leave before this time to get this. Um, that hotel. Sometimes um, there are we, less expensive hotels yeah. that we could stay at. That, you know, for conferences, but we might choose to um, stay at more expensive hotels, and then the district pays for that. Um, and so they are suggesting that we make those changes. Uh, and um, limit the amount of um, those types of expenses in the federal grants. And we don't have many because we really have not been traveling in the last couple of years. But they really want us to take a look at that, and I just need your feedback on whether you're interested in doing something like that. Yeah, I would say there's probably a hundred of those policies off that we could copy. Yeah, yeah, 100%. And, 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 and then you don't have to worry about receipts, and I mean, mm -hmm. that's how it's always worked. I can say my that, job, you uh, just get a certain amount per day, and as a grown-up, you decide how to spend that money. Um, and then you don't have to worry if you lose a receipt, or I mean, it takes the, it takes the headache out of your, mm -hmm. uh, your accounting people, too. Right, you just provide a, an agenda for the meeting and that's you know when you left and um that usually helps them calculate what you get yeah did, um, at the colleges we had uh, the same as the state and uh, it was never enough you couldn't eat at breakfast at mcdonald's and you covered the per diem but mm -hmm. that's like um, and the mileage uh, uh, as well um, we, we have our own 45 cents a mile which is the IRS is like almost 60 cents now. But 
uh, at least that is policy that we could copy because we can't go above three hours as they said we can. That's what other people have spent a lot of time put together. I just want to take advantage of their work. Um, so I'm going to share with you the email that was sent to our staff in November to give them a heads up on the possible um, changes that may have that may happen because of the OSHA plan implementation. Um, Arizona does have an OSHA plan, uh, and if um, we would need to meet those emergency temporary standards that OSHA is supposed to put out. Um, I did share all of that with our staff. When I checked in with the attorney um, late last week, he indicated that um, the Supreme Court is still hearing um, arguments and information that will continue to wait. OSHA indicates that they won't start enforcing until February. Um, but um, they, we just really are going to wait until um, the Supreme Court makes their decision. Because even after that, Arizona has to write and submit a plan um, that needs to be approved. So I just wanted you to know that. Um, We have a new school nurse guest. She was great. Her name is Dana Lujan, and she provided us with some really great information on um, um, to update in our Safe Return to School plan. Um, she suggested that, as we did last year, um, and even up until now, if you had one symptom, you had to go home. But um, she worked in the, in the COVID ward of a hospital and said that um, for them, it's um, one major symptom, and a major symptom is 100.4 degree temperature, shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, vomiting, diarrhea, loss of taste or smell. If you have one of those symptoms, then you you have to go home. Um, if you have two minor symptoms, um, to include nasal congestion or drainage, cough, sore throat, muscle aches, headache, and fatigue, you have to have two of those in order to be sent home. Um, we have so many kids and adults that have allergies, and so this would help us um, with, you know, making some determinations on when students um, and adults should be sent home. Uh, so she suggested that we put that into our Safe Return to School plan. Um, I also shared with you um, the new quarantine guidelines, which is five days. Uh, quarantine after you test positive, but the CDC guidelines indicate that then you must wear, they are recommending that you wear a mask for five full days after you return um, to public. As you know, we do not require masks in our district, so I am um, wanting your feedback on on those two things, because I'd like to, um, and then you can take a look at, um, here's of course no page number, but um, the um, suggestions from the CDC on if you test positive for COVID, isolate everyone regardless of vaccination status. Um, you would isolate, it tells you how long to stay home, but if you, now we get into if you have the vaccination then these are your, um, these are what you have to do. And then we have um, um, unvaccinated or if you receive the Johnson & Johnson or if you're over six months of receiving your last COVID shot. That's a lot for our staff to keep track of um, as far as trying to figure that out. And we do not require that people report their child or their vaccination status. So um, these would, some of these um, criteria would be very difficult for us to, um, to track and make sure that we 
implement properly. So I wanted your feedback on that because I think that's a pretty significant change. It's three more days that kids can come back to school, but um, then we have to talk about vaccinations and all of that. Right, and, and if we're talking about when somebody actually reports, like my, my kid is staying home today because they're COVID, they have mm -hmm. COVID, or, they, or somebody in our household is about to test positive for COVID, and then one tracking, okay, now they're back and they're supposed to be wearing a mask because of them within this period of time. And then, yeah, beyond that, it's not like everybody's self-reporting through the even know. Um, so I don't know how we could possibly, even if we said it, we were making a change and we wanted this to be our safe uh, return to schools plan, how we would possibly ensure compliance with it. And, and I don't think that it's feasible to, like realistic, to add that to the plate of any of our staff members. I agree. Me too. However, I think it's good information. Yes. We certainly <laughs> yes. Say yes. And share that. Yeah, I mean, it's a recommendation. Because but people do get I don't think we can um, get compliance. Like yeah. That. I, I Monitor think. and control compliance. Mm -hmm. it, it just would be a lot because then um, the school nurses would have to notify everyone of the student is returning on day five and has to wear a mask for five days. And then the, the classroom teachers and everyone else has to monitor to make sure that that child is wearing his mask, or, and even adults. So it's, um, it just is a lot of additional compliance on things that we are currently not requiring, and um, information that we are not requesting. I think it just goes back to, you know, what we decided, you know, back in October or whatever, that, you know, parents just have to be diligent of not sending their kids to school when they shouldn't be in school, you know, whether it's COVID or not. Right, if it's the flu exactly. or a bad cold. Exactly, it could be anything. It could be the flu rona now. <laughs> <laughs> so you just don't know. If, and so people need to keep their kids home. If their nose is running, they have a fever, whatever the case is, keep your kid home. Everybody wants to stay in school. You know, if, if you want to wear a mask, wear a mask. If you don't want to wear a mask, don't wear a mask. But yeah, you can't monitor people. And if nobody has a stamp on their forehead yet that says they've been vaccinated, it's right. I, I think it's fine to update our, you know, to continue to share what the current guidance is from the CDC, but be clear that we're not mandating that um, in our district. Like, this is the guidance. It'd be great if you follow these recommendations. Nobody's going to, you know, police you on them. But people also need to realize that when sick kids come to school, sick kids give it to our teachers. And if our, we have enough teachers out, they're not going to be able to have school. Yep. That, that's really what it's coming down to, that it, the cases are up so high right now that you know, the person sitting next to you probably has COVID. And if we're going to get to a place where we're not going to have enough teachers and we don't have enough substitutes. Right, that's the next topic. <laughs> um, right along with it. Thank you so much. Um, that that is a significant issue because at this point we do not have enough subs. We have everyone that's available to sub subbing, um, and um, teachers are we are having to when we get a call at seven seven thirty eight o'clock in the morning that somebody's not coming and we can't get a sub and we don't have anybody left in the building because we're already covering. Um, and these, these guys in the front row um, are pros at, you know what, I, I think I have this extra person, or I could send you this, or we could help out here. Um, they've been really working very well. Um, this week has been really significant for us uh, with so many staff out at um, the elementary school, um, and not, not so many at the um, at the high school or the middle school, but at the elementary right now. Uh, so it is um, if the trend does not change. So um, 
Like right now we had 66 students out yesterday at McDowell. Um, and it's time to get all the Wow. I'll just look at it during the meeting. Um, we, may, we may have to close some classrooms, and we did do that last year. Um, but we may have to, um, I'm, I'm, I'm a little concerned about what's going to happen once um, Maricopa County um, Department of Public Health gets our data from this week, that they may not um, declare us an outbreak site, and if they do, then we'll have to close school, um, because then we have to do those enhanced cleaning practices to get everything ready for everyone to come back. So um, it is, something of concern and um, something that we absolutely would coordinate with other um, organizations like um, Dr. Barnard suggested the Boys and Girls Club but undoubtedly uh, some of their staff is our staff too so um, but it is it is something that is it's coming to a head at this point well the good news is that all the reports show that this will downtrend probably in the next month. So if we can just get to January, yeah, but we have to get here. It is only January. Right, well, yeah. Um, I'm sorry. I know that was real optimistic. <laughs> <laughs> um, you just I know, I understand. Did I my bedtime too? <laughs> I know. It'll get grumpy. Yeah. Um, no, I, well, I think that I think we need to uh, give families a heads up. Yeah, I think they need to have a plan in place and say these are certain cir circumstances. This is what might happen, and um, yeah, just proactively communicate. Have a point of a website or something that people can go to to get sort of regular updates, um, and then let them know how it will be communicated. Like yeah. If the school does, if you do have to close the school in the morning, it's going to be a text message, a robocall, and an email, so that people know um, to be watchful. For whatever it is, so that yeah, they're not caught yeah. by surprise. Uh, you know, it's like when you were little there, and you had to sit in front of the TV and watch if your school was having a snow day. Yeah, yeah. Yes. yeah. 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 Watch if you're recording or zoning. I know, but now it's COVID, so watch and see if your school's closing because of COVID. <laughs> Uh, so we were um, required to add uh, school closure information to the end of the safe return to school plan. Uh, so that information is um, included in there now. Um, and it's based on the work that we did last year when we had to close the high school as well as close classrooms at McDowell Mountain. So um, we will uh, do our best. Our staff is doing a great job of notifying us as possible when they're not feeling well so that we can begin to plan. I, I want to make sure, um, so you're telling us that the how a school closure would be addressed is part of the state's return to school plan. Um, that's great. I want to make sure though, as Wendy was saying, that we have a communication this week saying that, you know, numbers are getting high, especially at the elementary school, we might have to close. And I don't want it to just say, and here's the updated safe return to school plan. I want some of those things like, if there's a school closure, this is how you'll find out front and center, because nobody's going to read a seven page updated thing to see what was updated. Like, we have to very clearly communicate the important information that they need. Um, so uh, it has been a practice in the district that when teachers sub for other teachers uh, by taking on um, their class during their prep or absorbing their class into their class, that after the fifth time they get compensated. I'd like to remove that fifth time requirement and just make sure that every time our staff has to absorb um, another class, so we might have a first grade teacher take on half of a first grade classroom and another one take on half of another classroom, um, that they get compensated because it, it's a lot of additional work with students that you're not familiar with. Um, and while we do that all the time, um, in this situation it's very difficult. We um, And we do have a lot of 
stand that are studying for other teachers, um, and I just want uh, your feedback on removing that requirement of the five and just paying them from the onset, because I think that that's the right thing to do. It is. It is the right thing to do. I'm curious what the, so fifth time, like five consecutive days, or are we no. saying like it could be the fifth time across the year and then you finally get paid for it? Yeah. Like, that's ridiculous. Yeah, that's what the district has. <laughs> the district has been doing that for years. So, um, all right, put that on, um, put that as something that we should talk about in our studies mission. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. Yes, we want teachers to get paid for the extra work. Okay. Anytime they take on extra students. Mm -hmm. yeah. And right away. Yeah. Yeah. And right yeah. away. Right. Not at the end of the year. year. Right. <laughs> um, and then I think lastly is um, the We've been offered lots of time to partner and provide at schools any of these testing methods, um, the field testing, the test day, home test day, training testing. Um, and in previous discussions, we've determined that we're not interested in doing these. Um, but I want to get your feedback on whether there are any of these that you want me to proceed with or um, want to learn more about or discuss because um, many of the school districts surrounding us are using a variety of these methods <coughs> and are having some success at being able to keep their COVID numbers down in their schools and keep their schools open and kids in, in class learning. Um, if you um, wanted to further discuss any of these. So home test we could give, we could send kids sick home with a home test there is that what that one mean <laughs> yeah or they could take it up I, I don't like um, people using uh, bodily fluids being exposed at school but I think if uh, the only one I would be comfortable with is if a parent requested a home test to do at school to do at home but I don't think we should get in, be in the business of teachers or kids or nurses I mean, yeah. saliva or nasal swabs and then again we get into like we can't force anybody to take a test so then we would have to be providing an option for uh, parents to opt their student out and then teachers would have to track mm -hmm. these kids are opted out and and again that's just additional responsibility the, the the teachers need to be teaching the kids they don't need to be tracking whether you can take a test uh, you know a covid test or not right but if someone's going to give us a bunch of free home tests, we can either sell them on the black market and make <laughs> them um, or we can distribute them to families who would like them. <laughs> okay, that's it. That's all I have. Okay. Uh, all right. So, uh, future action if you have an item that you'd like to see uh, on the future agenda, please reach out to Krista. Dates of upcoming meetings, we have a work study session at uh, 5 p.m. on Wednesday, January 26th, and then we have the business meeting planned uh, at 6 p.m. on Wednesday, February 9th. That concludes our business meeting. The board is now going to vote to go back into executive session. When we come back from executive session, all we're going to do is adjourn the business meeting. There's no further business being conducted, so you're all free to go home. Don't feel you have to hang out and wait for us to come back and adjourn. Thank you. Um, so with that said, I move that we uh, return to our executive session. Uh, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, I can take a uh, text five minutes. <laughs> Sorry, Dana. Sorry, Dana. Sorry, Dana.